So I think this should be a, an interesting dis discussion today, hearing from three very different types of businesses, obviously, in uh, Volkswagen, Morning Point Assisted Living, and Lee Smith. And knowing that really nobody's all cloud or nobody's all on-prem uh, really adds to that. So we'll get to hear about all different types of hybrid setups. But to get started, um, if you guys wouldn't mind, just maybe introduce yourself. Uh, and maybe just a little background, how long you've been with your company, and if there's any general info about, you know, major changes that you've seen in your IT strategy in the last couple of years. Let's just get started with that. Okay, welcome everyone. Knut Hilles, Volkswagen, Chattanooga Operations. Um, been with the company over 20 years in different locations, Mexico, headquartered Germany, Michigan, and, and since, um, 2010 now in Chattanooga. We love it, beautiful city. Hope we'll spend here many more years. Um, actually, I'm not a original IT guy. I actually have come out of the sales area, logistics, so ended up in IT, which is kind of interesting, looking a little bit with a non-tech view on some of the, the topics. So also, don't ask me any detailed technical questions today. I would have to refer that to some of my colleagues. Um, Volkswagen. I'm responsible for the manufacturing side in the US, which is one factory, that's Chattanooga. We have a, a sales wholesale headquarters in Virginia, Michigan. There are some other IT colleagues which have a lot more exposure to the cloud as a manufacturing environment. We'll get into that. Um, we are on the journey to the cloud, probably more at the, the beginning. Nevertheless, Volkswagen has big challenges, uh, connected vehicles, etc. so I'll go into that during the discussion today, trying to bring also the Volkswagen Global View on the cloud to the discussion. I'm Jeff Berger, uh, I'm Vice President at Lee Smith. Uh, Lee Smith is a heavy truck dealership. For those of you who don't know, the ridge cut off to the right behind the projects, there's about 60 acres there, we're there. Uh, we've family owned business since about 1935. Uh, so we've been around a long time. We now have three separate individual businesses. We have a freight brokerage company that has basically quadrupled in size in the past three years. Uh, and so that's been a struggle trying to maintain that growth with them and uh, kind of a different uh, demographic as far as what we're used to seeing as end users and things like that. So we've kind of gone uh, kicking and screaming into the cloud at this point. So uh, we're, there's bits and pieces of it that, that make a whole lot of sense, and then there's some of it that doesn't make as much sense to us, but some of our vendors are pushing us there, and, and just some of the, the needs of uh, our end users are pushing us there as well. Uh, I've been in Chattanooga for about 22 years now at Lee Smith, so uh, I've seen everything from green screens to, uh, to you know, mobile phones and all of the implementations that we're having to deal with now in the cloud. I'm uh, Aaron Barthel, uh, IT Director with Morning Point Senior Living. Uh, we were founded in 1997, celebrated our, our 20th anniversary as a company last year. Uh, we have a, about 30 different communities, several more in the pipeline, uh, assisted living, Alzheimer's care communities. And so really, we're, we're always trying to, to push the envelope for our customers, which is uh, for not only our management, but for our, our line staff who are caring. Who, we, we like to care for the caregivers and do what we can to support them and what makes sense for them. And so as we continue to grow, cloud has really made sense for us to, to continue to, to go at scale and do the best that we can for our, our end users and our, and our, our customers. Thanks, guys. And I, th I think something that a lot of the people in attendance today would be interested in hearing from you would be um, maybe as cloud has become more and more prevalent over the years, how has your view of the cloud changed since it first became an actual option uh, for incorporating into your IT strategy versus where you are today and moving forward? Just uh, your your opinion, how you uh, approach incorporating cloud solutions into your IT, uh, how has your view and opinion of that changed? Um, <clears throat> from a classical manufacturing point of view, you want to be able to touch your servers, you want to be able to see your network, you want to be able to quickly respond if you have an outage. So 
we, we produce one vehicle every minute. So if you have a five minute outage, you've lost five vehicles. So that very quickly adds up to a lot of loss for the company. So traditionally, everyone says, oh, I don't know, I need to see it. If it's in the cloud, so that's been also the thinking, I would say, three, four, five years ago. Right now, it is more, okay, how can we as IT really add value to, to the company? And um, are we really the ones who, who administer the, the, the server farm and the network, or are we ones that look at cloud-based solution, BI, et cetera, and can help the company save money on the operational side rather than administering IT? So that's a, it's, it's kind of a, let's say, a, a, a slow journey, but the, the understanding is there. If I don't need to take care of it locally, I know the AWS, Azure, whoever, they, they know that a lot better, more efficient than, than my own guys on premise. I can use them to generate more, more revenue for the company in, in a different way. But the skill sets are not necessarily there, so it's a, it's a slow journey to, to transition organizationally, processes, and also technology. We have a similar struggle. I, control is a big thing for us, right? So we're, we're one location. Uh, and when you get into multiple locations, it seems that the cloud makes a whole lot more sense than when you're in a single location. Uh, so if we can do it internally, our practice has always been we're just going to do it internally. We typically don't outsource stuff. We typically don't have other vendors do things. Uh, and uh, when we went from when we went to Office 365, it was more because that was a, a big push from Microsoft. You know, Office 365 was where they were going. That's where they're putting all their efforts into. And uh, when we moved our Exchange server offsite into, a, it's a hybrid environment. But when we did that, our initial thought was that, oh, Microsoft's going to do away with Exchange altogether at some point. And if they're going to do that, that means that we need to be planning for that. We need to be thinking about that. Uh, I, I do think uh, our perception has changed quite a bit over the past, you know, three to five years uh, in just the fact that we've had to deal with different knowledge level of employees and how they use computers and the network too. So I would say at, at first, you know, the, the cloud when it, you know, first came out was, and, and to some extent it still is, it was kind of an experiment, you know, everybody, uh, well, let's see how they use it. Let's see what happens. And so that was our initial stance. Was at first we're we're not going to touch it. We're not going to do anything with it. We're gonna we're gonna wait and see what other people let. Let's let other people make some mistakes, and then we'll see what we can do to to do better or to 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 learn from those as well. And so a, as that has kind of evolved, and as people have adopted it more, we've been been able to see where some areas are that we can find use for it. Uh, we can take advantage of other people's resources than having to have to do everything in house having to have all those resources there, we can have a, take advantage of some, something that someone else is providing for us. And so that's been a big advantage and that's been a, a slow adoption and it still is. It's, I, I would say it's a very thoughtful process. We wanna go very forward very thoughtful rather than just jumping right in. Thank you and I know um, Knut, you mentioned the uh, manufacturing industry and just the characteristics and mindset of manufacturers kind of influencing uh, cloud adoption and versus managing everything on site and being able to touch and see. Um, are there other factors uh, based on the industry you each are in uh, or factors based on the specific ways in which your company operates that have led you to be either more conservative or more aggressive uh, with cloud adoption and the way uh, you have already incorporated it into the company? <clears throat> Yes, so on the manufacturing side, you, <clears throat> you have a lot of, um, I call it gray IT, shadow IT, you have a lot of IT-based solutions that come into the factory through line builders, through robots you install, so not everything is always really in a controlled environment, and, and, and one of my daily struggles is how to get rid of my old, oldest Windows XP clients that are still running in, in some parts of the line, which are out of support, obviously, the security risk, but if I pull them out, I'll stop the line. So those are typical in, uh, manufacturing challenges on, on um, where you have technology that is sometimes over 10 years old because you're heavily driven by um, 
I would I call them the investment waves. When you when you add new product, if you retool your factory, that's when you have downtime, and then when you can invest money and and replace some of those solutions. But it's not that you have a big window of, of change every year. You, you have to work around shutdown times, and it's it's not that easy in the manufacturing industry. You're always looking for efficiency in every every dollar. You you get efficiency out of the existing infrastructure count. So that is the the big, biggest challenge on. When is the end of life of our, let's say, of, of, of our virtual environment, our storage? And is that something we can move to the cloud? It's not that we say we'll do that next year. You, you really have to sync it up with everything else going on. And that, that is it's my biggest challenge. When do I move which part to the cloud? We, we just went live a couple of months ago with success factors in the cloud. So we, we're moving part of our HR solution slowly to the cloud, but there's going to be a three year project and this is more um, service on <clears throat> in, in the cloud it's not really infrastructure or platform as a service yet that that's still to come you know in, in our industry one of the things that's happening now is is I'll call it connected vehicles that's extremely popular uh, where you put a, a telematics device in a truck and it sends you uh, data uh, through the cloud basically so before you know that your truck's having a problem, we know that your truck's having a problem. So we're, we can be proactive, but in that, the manufacturer, we're, we're a dealership, so we deal with like the likes of Volkswagen and International, Ford, Isuzu. Uh, but the manufacturers are, are pushing us into environments like the cloud that they, they, uh, they're utilizing uh, in International's case, it's Azure. Uh, but, uh, I think uh, a lot of that data and a lot of that, and I guess the best way to put that is a lot of the uh, incentives that they're providing us are based behind that uh, information and how we can proactively assist our customers in, in taking care of their problems before they occur. Uh, another thing with the dealership, on the dealership and the transportation side, a lot of what we're captive to is what our vendors are doing. Uh, I know I mentioned that with Microsoft, but we have we have two primary vendors in the dealership and the transportation company, and depending on what they're doing with their software will also depend a lot on where we go with the cloud in the future too. So I have a feeling you'll see a lot of their environments start to move up to the cloud as you get into things like blockchain and you get into things like uh, uh, connected vehicles and things like that that'll talk back to our DMS and our TMS products. So I think uh, our industry is pushing a lot of that and moving a lot of that forward. I would have to say growth. Uh, right now we have over, over a billion Americans who are taking advantage of assisted living care in the United States. Uh, that's just going to continue to to grow and to expand, and and as that does continue to grow and expand, uh, we will continue as a as an organization to continue and grow and expand to meet the need. So, what does that look like in the future? What can we take advantage to provide better care? What will our our future residents expect uh, out of the services? Will we become a an ancillary internet provider? Uh, people want more connected devices. They want to be able to use their devices wherever they're at. So being able to, to see that, that's kind of how our, our industry is, is, is going, where it's going, and, and we need to be able to be responsive to that. I apologize. I'm going to go a little off script here and ask a question that wasn't uh, part of the pre-planned. Uh, yeah, I'm a curveball kind of guy, but I think this would be interesting for the people in the room, and I would assume a lot of folks in here are uh, IT director or admin or directly involved in the uh, IT department within your company. Um, what's it like with other departments within your company from, you know, other company executives, the CFO, the COO, you know, the financial side of the business? Do they have specific requests for you? How do you collaborate with them to follow suit with what they're asking, but also move forward with IT, you know, under your management and control as you, you know you need to, uh, based on your own expertise? How does that work in your company? Yeah, so, I mean, again, I'm going to refer to, we have three different companies. The freight brokerage is the one that we probably get the most of that inform, that demand from, uh, from a technological standpoint. They're growing so fast that they require so much, and, and we're 
trying to figure out where they get information. There's a there's a, a, a BI company locally uh, that we've talked to in the past that, that we were trying to get integrate their data, our, our internal data with their stuff to provide information for that company. Uh, you know, we don't get a lot of push from C-level people about how to get our information into the cloud. Uh, we are getting a, a lot into the scenario where I've got my iPad, I've got my iPhone, I want to be able to get to this, uh, which was one of the incentives for moving to Office 365. Our, our president uh, and owner, he's on his iPad all the time. He uses it five times more than he uses his computer. So he's always, okay, so let's put him on OneDrive. He's the first person to go to OneDrive, and he and his executive assistant function out of OneDrive completely, I think. It, at this point, so I think that's uh, that's just been a big factor in our decision to move to Office 365. Either of you, other two guys, have sure. something you'd like to add to that? Sure. I would I would say that uh, collaboration is key. So uh, to to stay involved with your your C levels, to check in, to see what their needs are, what's going on. Uh, if there's uh, if there's a need, let's communicate it. Let's talk about it. We're we're blessed to often be brought in and, and say, hey, here's what we'd like to do. And so, okay, we get to go back and say, we'll present you three different options, a way we, ways we can do that. So, uh, to to, be, to have that collaboration is really key to to be able to speak with your C levels and and to see what's going on, see the needs, and be able to meet them. From experience, the um, C level. Is very depends on the affinity to technology. So I've seen from one extreme to the other. So whenever there's somebody pushing and being a driver, even in, in, in the different business areas, for me it's it's I'm I'm happy I have an owner who wants it, and I'm more than happy to drive it with him, and and get the funding and and get the solution. Too many times IT has great ideas, we implement them, and then they're stuck. And nobody uses them, and it's a waste of money. So for me, it's it's an opportunity. If, if there's a driver, you need to ask the right questions around security and how do you manage it and what is it, the long-term cost because a lot of solutions generate a lot of long-term cost, but for me it's, um, it's an opportunity rather than, let's say, a, a risk or a challenge. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, and I know um, one of the things that's probably top of mind in IT in general is education and skills. You know, you hear in the news all the time about there being a shortage of uh, skilled workers, IT professionals. Um, I can't remember the statistics specifically, but uh, you know it's often said that there's way more job opportunities than there are candidates available to fill highly skilled IT positions. And so what I'm curious about from each of your perspectives based on your own company, is cloud IT skills something you're looking at uh, for, for your employees, either through training of existing employees, uh, through recruiting new employees, or maybe even through uh, outsourcing through uh, partners. How do you approach uh, the IT skill set of, of specific cloud skills? Um, for us, it's, it, it, it's a challenge. We have, um, just for our location, we have 200 plus applications that we're running. We are obviously part of a worldwide company with a lot of headquarter standards they are coming down to us so main focus is um, keep the lights on keep production running and make sure that what we do have works and then if we have some spare time we'll, we'll look at some of the um, technologies but in, in the day-to-day -day, production takes priority and that that's normally does a lot of time to do side projects so a couple of things we've done We've done with, tried with UTC a couple of projects where we invite students and we've looked at um, last semester at virtual reality and cloud technology and in the past at business analytics and bringing the, the, the students to VW for one semester, a couple of projects, team them up with our specialists and so trying to open up the eyes of, of, of the internal team and showing how the, the, the students operate and, and, and their skill set and that that has opened the eyes for some and, and brought a new perspective to it. Yeah, we struggle similarly with trying to keep up with just what we have internally. So we have a fairly small IT staff. Uh, we're not near the size Volkswagen is. And uh, we support quite a few applications internally. So 
uh, that of course comes first. Uh, one of the things that, that we try and do on a regular basis is attend industry events and things like that, like Microsoft Ignite, VMware, VMworld, and, and some of those things to, to kind of keep up to what's going on. Uh, Chot Tech events like this, you know, they're fantastic. Uh, and you learn lots from these things. Uh, but uh, there's nothing in particular that we do uh, that, that we say, okay, well, this person has to have this skill set, this person has to have this skill set uh, based on the cloud specifically. So our, our task at this point is to educate who we have, what we have, and, and try and bring forward that knowledge that we've already got. You guys don't have a lot of time to do anything outside of, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm with you, I understand. Um, I would say, kind of, kind of going off what Jeff said, we're not looking for any one particular cloud skill set. Uh, I would say, as it represents such a paradigm shift in doing things, the biggest thing I would be looking for is the willingness to serve and the willingness to learn. Uh, just because uh, something's been done a certain way isn't a, a, a necessarily a good excuse to continue doing it that way. So, being able to see things from all angles and say, "Here, I, I, we're willing to embrace this. We're willing to do something," is, is uh, could mean the world. Maybe just to reiterate my point, two of my colleagues were supposed to be here with the priority at work, so I think their stickers are still up there. They would have loved to be here to listen to this, but day-to-day -day priorities took over. Yeah, so it sounds like you know day-to-day -day operations are super demanding within the IT department, and I would say that's pretty <clears throat> commonplace in just about every business out there. Uh, and so, you know, that's something that I'm sure uh, organizations like the um, uh, Chattanooga State Community College and places like that are probably looking really closely at how they can prepare people to sort of jump right in, but also to have a mindset toward, you know, cloud skills and where things are headed. Maybe can, maybe can add one um, different point of view of what our headquarters did back in Germany, because they had the same challenge. There are 1,500, 1,600 IT experts there, and um, they basically created small labs. They called it the digital lab, the smart production labs, the data labs, and they moved them from the headquarter to Munich, to Berlin, far away from the headquarters. That you're 10 guys, 15 guys, you're on your own, no standards, you can have a Mac, you don't need to have a, a Windows laptop, you buy your tools, whatever you want, and just see what you can do. So get them out of the day-to-day -day and send them far away from the politics and, and, and the typical headquarters. And that's where these, these projects coming from and the proof of concepts, and then they slowly move into production. Yeah, that's really cool. So I know in speaking to you guys planning for uh, today's discussion, there were obviously some very different ways in which your three companies have incorporated cloud technologies. And I know, Knut, you said that um, Volkswagen operates its own data center and provides cloud services internally to the different uh, company divisions and locations. Can you just speak a little bit about um, you know, your perspective uh, of Volkswagen's IT operations from a private company-owned cloud and how that has worked out uh, with your day-to-day -day operation? <clears throat> The strategy was put, we'll, we'll need to in, implement a Volkswagen private cloud platform inside the Volkswagen data center at the headquarters. So that was, was the first step, um, which was based on OpenStack. So the decision was open source to make sure that the, the, the community and the innovation is there and the speed to keep it, keep it updated. Um, a lot of one of the standards was also Docker technology to make sure it's containerized so you can move it around the cloud. It's, it started in our own data center. Eventually, um, we have a location in Iceland, a, a high performance data center where a lot of our infrastructure currently sits. But with 140 locations worldwide, 600,000 people, the, the idea is really build up an internal cloud within Volkswagen. So it's, it's a private cloud. Um, so started off as an infrastructure as a service now with um, we chose Cloudflare as a the platform to move it to a platform as a service also open source within the, the community and um, now we're at the 
point that it's actually moved to a, to a hybrid cloud. We have, we have integrated AWS, Azure, and other um, public clouds and have a hybrid slash multi-cloud approach worldwide. And um, I now just, was six, seven months ago, our VW.com webpage that hopefully some of you use, if not, please today, by Atlas, made in Chattanooga. Um, that was over a, over a weekend moved from, from AWS to Google and just moved over, nobody noticed, it completely containerized and that's sitting in the public cloud but fully integrated into the group IT cloud as we, we call it within, within Volkswagen. So that is growing. We have different digital platforms for our after sales division, for our sales marketing divisions. Um, the global production digital platform is being being developed as we speak and eventually our manufacturing application is going to run on cloud technology. It's not fully decided in terms of do we still need an on-prem cloud technology in each of the factories to for, for perf performance or disaster recovery and failover reasons or can we f actually have a cloud platform off-prem and run a manufacturing environment so those are being developed as we speak, but all, as I said, based on OpenStack, Docker, Cloudflare, um, as our internal cloud. Yeah, and for, you know, not many companies can afford to own and operate their own data center facility in Iceland. Um, so for the rest of the companies out there, one uh, attractive option could be to build your own infrastructure in a co-location facility or a local data center. Um, operated by a, another private company. Uh, does, do any of you guys have experience with uh, co-location facilities or um, other data center operations? No. Just curious if that's something anybody had perspective on. Uh, sure. I don't have any experience with co-locations. We do have, in our area, we actually have two data centers. We have one down at the end of the road uh, so um, we have 10 buildings and about 60 acres. And so uh, all our disaster recovery at this point is, is pointed uh, to a building at the other end of the road. Uh, so, I mean, if a tornado rolls through, we're still in trouble. But, you know, it, it, in most cases, if a fire occurs or something occurs, we'd, we'd actually have some redundancy, but no co-location at this point. Actually, to clarify, our location, Iceland, is a, is a co-location we partnered so I guess the next step to beyond owning and operating a data center or uh, doing a co-location facility would be completely utilizing a cloud service from a third-party provider. Uh, and, you know, the, the solutions are commonly referred to as a service, so software as a service, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service. And those are, uh, you know, typically services that are owned and managed completely by the third party. And so really you're only responsible for what happens on top of those services, um, but not behind them. So can each of you sort of speak to uh, some of the experiences you've had so far with one of those three scenarios, either software infrastructure or platform as a service from a third party? So for manufacturing division here in Chattanooga, we main experience has been with, with um, software as a service. So we've, um, as I mentioned already, we moved to success factors. We've long been on, on Concord for all our travel management, etc. So, but all in the indirect area, all for the, for the administrative area and exploring opportunities now, how, what else can we move to uh, software as a service? The infrastructure platform as a service still, still for the future. So yeah, ours, primarily our, our largest software as a service deployment has been Office 365 at this point. Uh, we, we have done CRM and a few other, other smaller projects in the cloud, but uh, Office 365 was the largest one. Uh, and we actually chose to go with a third party to help us through that migration as well. So uh, it was, trying at best, a lot of planning. Uh, so it's, it's not completely cloud. Uh, it, we do have a, an on-site exchange server, so it's, it's somewhat hybrid at this point, but from the email standpoint. Uh, and 
Along with that, we have uh, our backups are in the cloud. You have to, Microsoft does not back up your data in Office 365, so you have to be responsible for backing up your own data from their cloud. So we chose Barracuda as a partner to do that uh, so that we could uh, make sure that we have all that data somewhere other than in Microsoft's cloud. So uh, that, that for us has been the biggest one. Being a 20-year-old company, it's been advantageous. Uh, really, a, a lot of what we use in the organization is your SaaS offerings, your web applications, and, and it's what we primarily use. So we'll work with different vendors as we see fit for, to, serve, to, to serve different needs, whether that's, that's uh, uh, providing a, our accounting system, our care, hiring, uh, scheduling, uh, just uh, whatever we can do to deliver care, we have always traditionally worked with work with vendors and third parties and, and for to, to, to get us to our SaaS offerings. So that's that's kind of what we we kind of grew up with, if you want to say. So it's been advantageous uh, talking with with some other folks in the industry uh, who, who kind of see where we're at, but they're they're much older in the industry. Are saying, hey, we're, we're going. We want to be where you're at, even though we're a younger company. And so that's just kind of where cloud has taken us. So that's a, that's a, an interesting thing to to point out. So you know, beyond um, just the the basic licensing model of software as a service, you, you sort of alluded to this in your answer, Mark, in that your Outlook information, your Microsoft Office 365 information is not inherently backed up uh, somewhere beyond the servers that it's being served to you from. And so, you know, beyond just the, the basic shift in uh, licensing models, what other considerations, if, if you're evaluating a software as a service platform uh, that you, you might incorporate into your IT uh, stack or your IT deliverables internally, what are the type of things you need to look at uh, before actually purchasing and deploying something? Jack, yeah, I'll take it. Uh, so, you know, the first thing, Mike, reluctance to go into the cloud was based on if I go into the cloud how do I get out of the cloud so I, I you know what if it doesn't work out you know what if Microsoft's down all the time what if this data center's down what if we're stuck on one data center and it's always having problems or whatever but so the first question we asked was how do we get out uh, which is why our exchange uh, implementation is hybrid because it does allow us an out if we want to get out uh, the, the second one is what's the vendor doing you know, where's their big push? Their big push is in the cloud in Microsoft's case. Uh, the third was cost. You know, can I do it cheaper in-house? Uh, and for how long can I do it cheaper in-house? Have I already got that licensing paid for, which we did have? And, and so we, when we did our transition into the, the cloud, we actually made sure that we're gonna do it in a way that's cost effective. So at the point of time that our, our volume license expired and we were having to renew, then we went through that process at then. Uh, and, and then the other thing is, do you have the resources to handle it? I mean, because honestly, it's taken probably more time to, to administer the cloud than it did just on-prem for the most part. But uh, we were being audited by Microsoft once a year to do the self-evaluation. It would take three or four months of back and forth emails just to get them to, to say, okay, we're done with this audit and it just wasn't worth the time anymore. Since we've moved to the Office 365 suite, it's, we haven't had a single audit, so. Does anyone else? Yeah, if you guys have yeah. an answer to that, please. Yeah. Uh, I think I would have to, to agree with the cost effectiveness. Uh, go, well, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to use your, your resources and, and your personnel if you don't need to. If you've got other things you've got to do and you wanted to, to move and, and use resources of someone else, then that's, that's perfectly okay to do that. And so that's just kind of what we look to, to see. I mean, when, you, when you're going for any offering, it's, it's what are we trying to accomplish? You know, who, who, who do we want to, how do we want to accomplish it? And who are we doing it for? So if we're doing it, uh, if we're not doing it to further a business goal, then we really probably don't need to be doing it. 
So uh, where we can leverage cloud, what it makes sense to do in the organization is, you know, when, when we have a problem, what are we trying to solve? If it makes sense to do it in the cloud, we'll do it in the cloud. If it makes sense for something for us to do it on-prem, then we'll do it on-prem. And, and of course, it all depends on what we're working with, what we're talking about, what types of data we're working with. And uh, then we'll have to, of course, evaluate security needs and all that. Uh, a big thing for me is, is when we're looking at any offering is, is getting, getting a, getting take from peers, uh, getting information from that, seeing it in action, uh, getting to, to see what you're getting. Marketing is great and sales salespeople do a great job, but uh, I'd like to see things, something and, and see it in action and see what other people's experience has been with it before we, we jump into something. I think the cost and also resource effectiveness is, is, is a big driver when we look, for example, at, at success factors. Um, one, one driver is we, we move it from the traditional SAP into success factors. We got the commitment from our colleagues and, and personnel. We're going to do a standard 100% just as success factor provides no custom development, no, no, no exception handling, no unique processes just for us. So we had efficiencies on our application support for the traditional SAP. And basically, it's almost completely out of the hands of, of, of the IT department. It is, it's, it's a personnel decision. They can change their, their workflows, their, their customization by themselves. And there's very little IT spending you have. So there you, you have a, a business case where you can say that that makes sense. On other sides, when, when the vendors are, are very hard pushing, I always a little um, doubtful because at the end of the day, they want to make more money, not less money. So that means for me, it's not going to get cheaper. And we have those discussions right now with SAP on moving to s um, or staying on the, on the traditional um, ERP that we are on. And um, when we as a company, as Volkswagen, we pool our licenses worldwide. So there are huge efficiencies on the licensing costs and, and, and moving to s 4 is one of the first ones. Those licenses are very expensive still. We cannot do license pooling, et cetera. So, all those, those if, uh, that, that matters. Yeah, and you mentioned SAP. I know, you know, SAP and Microsoft Dynamics, there are a lot of vendors out there who are really moving to, uh, let's just call it what it is, sort of a forced cloud model, <laughs> subscription-based model. And, you know, I've heard mixed feedback on that, some pro, some con, and that, you know, that will always be the case. But um, I thought I'd bring up at this point, we're currently running a um, IT benchmarking survey, uh, InfoSystems is, and uh, it's on our LinkedIn page. If you go to the InfoSystems LinkedIn account, it's pinned as our first post on the account. You can click and take the survey. And we would really appreciate that because it gives us a lot of uh, insight into what's happening all around the area, companies of all different sizes. And if you take the survey, you get the benchmark analysis at the end of the survey, but something I would mention um, that I've seen on a lot of the responses so far, there is a question about cloud adoption, and basically um, the, the question is framed that if you are evaluating a cloud uh, um, solution as an alternative to an on-site solution, what are the most important factors um, that would help drive that decision? And one of the most common answers I've seen uh, is that if it has a positive impact on customer satisfaction and the, the ability to deliver your company's services in a better way. Um, I would wonder if you guys agree with that, if that's a major focus uh, from your perspective of uh, helping the company deliver services and what's your perspective on, you know, your uh, incorporating cloud into that, my, if there would be a positive or negative impact, or, or if that plays a factor at all. Do you have any input on that? <clears throat> it definitely plays a factor for, for our end customers. So we're selling 10 million cars a year, and most of them, or more and more of those cars are gonna be, have connected services. So that, um, same on, on, on the truck side. So that data needs to be hosted. You'll need, it needs to be available. Uh, you need to have good performance, a lot of integration with mobile applications, onboard applications within the vehicle. So um, if you talk about that use case, there's, I think, no way around to really partner with a big cloud provider to, to get that, that scale worldwide for, for your vehicles. Um, 
if you look into the internal customers and our administrative areas and day-to-day -day users, well, if it's not the most performant application, it doesn't mean we're selling less cars. It's, it might be an inconvenience and something we need to consider, but there it's not as high of priority than for our end customers. Yeah, for us, it's, it's, it's about productivity, right? I mean, so the, the whole goal is to make our employees more productive. And as our employees get more productive, hopefully they provide better customer service. So uh, ultimately, that's how we stay in business is keeping our customers happy. So uh, yeah, absolutely, that does fall right in line with that. The, but the, the key for us when we're making that decision as to what to do is, is, is it actually going to make our employees more productive? Or are they taking a step backwards? Is it going to make it more difficult for them? I think we, we absolutely would be able to be willing to, to entertain to, to do something 100% cloud if it's going to add efficiency, if it's going to, going to do something for our customers. Uh, my big, big question would be, uh, let's make sure our policies are clear. What are they doing with the data that they have? And do we have a way to get it on a routine basis? Can we include it as part of our backups? Because we don't want their, their service to go away, something to happen, and then we're, we're stuck without our data. Or are they, are they selling it to Cambridge Analytica? Or is Cambridge Analytica selling it? You know, what's going on with that? You know, that's, we just need to know where the data resides and make sure we can get our hands on it routinely. Yeah, I would say just you know, based on what you guys have said in response to that and just based on the feedback from the survey, it seems that there's a very uh, openness or willingness to adopt cloud into your IT strategy, uh, but it has to make sense, it has to be cost effective. I mean, these are no brainers, right? But you know, ultimately, I think the cloud providers and the different cloud services that are out there are looking more now instead of, instead of just doing things for the sake of the cloud, which seemed to be the strategy for a long time, things have now shifted to, to how do we help customers deliver to their customers in a more efficient and better way. And, I, and that's, in my opinion, a good shift in the industry. As a final question, what would you say would be an ideal state of your IT systems in three to five years from this point? Ideal IT state. I'll stick with it. It, it. it will be a hybrid model. It will always be on-prem IT infrastructure. Um, ideally, with the amount of resources I have available, I'll be able to provide twice as much services, productivity, and solutions to my, to, 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 to my end users and help my company generate um, more revenues, be more cost efficient, and change the view of IT from being a cost um, factor of being somebody who can help the company to be successful. I'm not even gonna answer. That's that's the answer. I mean, there's. Some... Uh, I would completely agree. Uh, the only thing I, I would say is that you know I, I mentioned we were, we were dipping our toes in the, the the waters of cloud, and so we continue want to go down that route. And hybrid is absolutely the place to be. And so to be able to have that infrastructure at, and in both places is is where we want to end up. All right, well, uh, I would just like to thank the panelists, thank uh, Chattanooga Technology Council, thank HPE for sponsoring this event today. And again, um, if any of you can make it out to STIR at 5 o'clock p.m., uh, the Infosystems team and the HPE team in attendance will be there. We'll have some uh, drinks and some food. You can ask some questions uh, to David and Chris, specifically about HPE and, and the future of their company. And uh, thank you all very much for attending today and giving us your time.